Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Wes Garland from Garland Music, and today's topic is the Leslie crossover. What is a crossover? What kind of crossover is in the Leslie? Why do you need one? And since this is a technical channel, how do you rebuild one? So this is a pretty typical Leslie crossover. You'll find these in every uh, vintage Leslie speaker that has both uh, a treble horn up top and a bass horn in the bottom. So that includes models 122 and 147. And you'll find variations of these in all of the other speakers like that, like the model 51C, the 31H, the 21H, the 22H, and so on and so forth. You won't find them in single speaker models like the Leslie 120 or 125 because they're not needed there. And you'll find that these crossovers can look a little bit different depending on the model and the age of the speaker, but generally speaking, um, they all work the same way. So this one came out of, um, I guess this is probably a 147 cabinet. Um, appears to be 1960s vintage, probably mid 1960s somewhere. Uh, in fact, yes, I can see this cabinet was made on the 189th day of 1963. Um, so the crossover goes right here. I've already removed it. To remove it, you just need a flat tip screwdriver. And I have placed the crossover on my workbench. So there's a lot of confusion about what the components are of the crossover. Um, I have a lot of techs misidentifying crossover capacitors as crossovers. Uh, Trek 2 sells an excellent uh, crossover capacitor for reconditioning these, but it's not the full crossover. So this is the full crossover. Now the crossover has two capacitors. Now they're both in the same physical housing, but there's two capacitors in here. One coil here, one coil here. Now these inductors are just wound up wires, um, but they do actually change the audio. And a connector here, and a connector there. So this connector here goes into the amplifier. This connector goes to the upper speaker. And there's a similar connector right there that the lower speaker plugs into as well. And when it's in your Leslie, it's in this orientation. So this essentially is a lid on that circle thing I showed you a minute ago. So as we all know, a Leslie speaker has both um, horns and a drum, and the high frequencies come out of those horns, and the low frequencies come out of that drum. The crossover's job is to separate the low frequencies from the high frequencies. Um, when you send a full range, frequent, full range sound in from your organ, the crossover splits it to the, from the lows and sends the lows down low and splits the highs out, sends the highs up high. How it works is um, a, basically a high pass circuit and a, a low pass circuit uh, that together form a, a crossover. Uh, for the really nerdy people out there, um, the, this crossover design is based on Otto Zobel's M-derived filter math. It's not a Butterworth or, or similar filter. Uh, it was a common design in uh, engineering textbooks um, in the, you know, the 30s. And that's probably where Don Leslie got uh, that design from. Actually, if you pull up the right textbook, you can, you can see the exact same circuit in use. So the, um, the circuit itself is centered at 800 hertz. Um, and it is a second order filter, meaning that it attenuates 12 dB per octave. Um, we all know how big an octave is. Uh, 12 dB is a lot of sound, but not all of it. So what that means is that your Leslie speaker actually has content in it that's meaningful uh, from the horn down to 400 Hertz um, and in the drum up to 1600 Hertz. Uh, so if uh, you have a sound guy, make sure that he's not uh, choking your signal at the wrong places. Um, now, how big uh, is that and, and where is 800 hertz? I'm just going to walk over here to the organ and I'll show you. So 800 hertz 
is actually about halfway between this G and that A flat, but it's, it's closer to the G. So that's the center point of the crossover, and there's meaningful audio down to here and up to here in the crossover range that actually gets sent to both speakers, okay? So the upper speaker will go as far down as this, and the lower speaker will go as far up as this. And they're both the same strength in the middle. So we all love that swirly Leslie goodness. And how that happens is we actually hear the interaction of the two speakers as we are speeding up and slowing down the Leslie. So if you listen to the organ, again, 800 hertz is here, four is here, 1600 hertz is here, and this is our overlap zone. Now, if I play that overlap zone with the Leslie speeding up, you should be able to hear both speakers. At the end, you've heard the drum hit full speed. Now I'm going to slow us back down. And that was all content in that overlap zone between the two the sides or the bottom and the top of the Leslie speaker. And So rebuilding the crossover, this is about the easiest technical task that the uh, Hammond organ service technician uh, will have to do. Uh, the reason that we do it is twofold. One, it will restore uh, clarity and drive to a Leslie speaker. All of the Leslies that have this age of crossover need that rebuild. But most importantly, what happens when this capacitor starts to fail is the crossover frequency for the upper horn drops. And because lower frequencies have more energy, that puts more energy into the V21. And the problem with that is that the V21 horn driver is already a little under spec for the Leslie and you can crack the diaphragm if you're playing it aggressively and having a f an old crossover that is putting too much energy out makes that failure much more likely. So the very first thing I do with any job like this is I recap um, the Leslie crossover. It's inexpensive, it's fast, and it's very good protection for the customer. Um, and at the end of the day, the organ sounds better, so it's win, win, win. Uh, rebuilding it is really straightforward. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to remove this cork. Uh, we don't need that anymore. It's just there's a spacer um, in uh, uh, the factory setup to keep this fairly heavy piece of uh, capacitor from falling. Remember, it's oriented like that in the organ. Uh, we're going to replace this capacitor with a pair of capacitors and some terminal strips, and we're just gonna wire it up exactly the way that we find it here. So for this job, you're going to need a couple of capacitors. I use rivets to mount uh, the terminal strips to um, the crossover board. You're gonna need a drill, and uh, I'd recommend some kind of adhesive as well, and of course, you're gonna need your soldering iron. Um, the capacitors that I use are 12 and 8 microfarad parts from M MKP Audio Filer. Um, the stock values are 12.5 and 7.8 microfarad. 12 and 8 are close enough. If you run the math, you'll see it doesn't make a darn bit of difference as long as uh, these are tight tolerance parts. And they're 3% parts, which they are. Uh, these are rated 400 volts. I wouldn't use anything under 100 I'd probably use 150 just to give myself some um, uh, breathing room. I always like having a, a little bit uh, when you, again, when you do the math, you'll find out that really we're expecting peaks of around 50 volts or so. Um, but there's always those weird transients that you don't want your caps failing for. And whatever you do, don't use electrolytic capacitors here. Use film caps. Okay, here we go. So we're going to cut these wires quite close to the capacitor body. I always like to leave a little tiniest length just so I can see what went where if I have any questions later. 
We don't need any diagrams for this job. Because the diagram is written right on the capacitor. White, common, 7.8 microfarad red, 12.5 microfarad black. So keep the old cap until you're ready to, until you're finished. Get the old staples out. You don't want those rubbing on your caps or your wires later causing a failure because um, your customer's organ has been on the road in a van traveling around with his van for 12,000 days. Piece of scrap plywood. Shout out to Tyler Wayne Dravick from Boss Oregon in Massachusetts for sending me this awesome board. It was at the bottom of a bunch of parts I bought from him. <laughs> Okay, so the next thing I do is plan where my parts are going to go. Okay, now we're going to solder the capacitors in. And to do that, I have to remember which one is common, white. So we're going to have the two of them coming down on to the white wire down here. And then two of them are going to be separate over there. Oh, and it is the 12.5 microfarad one that's black, so the black will go on this side. It's the easiest way to wire it up. If you get it wrong, it's no big deal. Make sure the electrical stuff is right, but I try to do things the easy way when I can. One thing I almost forgot. Take half the cardboard, slide it underneath where the capacitors are. That way, if you don't do that, and the adhesive that you use on them fails, you can have the capacitor vibrating like that. Eventually, after, you know, 12,000 miles in a van over dirt roads or whatever, you might uh, discover an unexpected failure. And my adhesive of choice is GE Type 2 silicone. I use Type 2 because it is non-acidic. Uh, you can tell if your silicone is acidic by smelling it. If it smells like vinegar, it's acidic. Okay, so here we have the finished product. Um, I will let it sit on the bench overnight so that the adhesive can set up. Um, the adhesive isn't really necessary, like I said, but I like to have it just to cut down on vibration. Um, as you can see, I have just copied the schematic that is on the old capacitor. So 12.5, the big one to black, the little one to red, and white is common. White is common. Red to the little one, black to the big one. The terminal strips are riveted in place. And when we put this back in the Leslie, that should present a nice professional uh, appearance uh, for the owner to see. And it's also how I can tell at a glance that I have um, recapped a crossover that I find in the field. So thanks for watching. I hope you learned something useful about crossovers. Uh, if you have any questions, put them in the comments.